dear participants, welcome to today's session of the Law on the Bosphorus International Summer School Program. We have been doing this program for two years online due to the pandemic. However, it is good to continue to organize such programs, especially since it is about the Istanbul Convention and current issues related to women, which makes it even more important. And it's an honor to be a part of this program. Before presenting our first speaker today, I would like to tell you a little about myself. Let, you, let me introduce myself first. My name is Begüm Tokyos, and I'm a research assistant in Istanbul University Faculty of Law in the Department of Criminal and Criminal Procedure Law. I work here since 2016, and I'm also a PhD candidate at the moment who tries to write uh, her doctoral thesis. Our first speaker is Eletra Stradella. She works currently as an associate professor in the University of Pisa in Italy in the Department of Comparative Law. Also, she especially works on the gender equality, robotic technologies, and of course, women rights. And today we will have the opportunity to listen to her presentation titled, Women and Multiculturalism in the Framework of the Istanbul Convention. So, Professor Stradella, we look forward to hearing your presentation. You have 45 minutes, except for the Q&A part. And now the stage is yours. Thank you for the floor. I want uh, to thank Istanbul University and Professor Suzer for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you. And um, I want to say, please, uh, during or after the presentation, you can write on the chat all the comments, remarks, questions, and I will collect them at the end of my presentation of my lecture. Uh, the topic of this lecture is the relationship between multiculturalism and women's rights in the framework of Istanbul Convention. Um, political philosophy, constitutional law, uh, criminal law, and comparative law deal with the issue of the possible conflict between multiculturalism and women's rights since many years, you know. We'll see that the debate has moved from uh, adversarial positions expressed by liberal feminists on this point to the attempt to decolonize the discourse on the compatibility between the protection of minority rights and the full and effective guarantee of women's rights. To discuss this question, it is necessary to start, from, according to my opinion, from the philosophical approach. And the milestone is represented, of course, by the investigation by Susan Molleroki. Her question, is multiculturalism bad for women? Uh, remain a crucial doubt questioning theoretical and legal scholars trying to find the best solutions in order to manage multicultural society. Okin underlines that the relationship between the constitutional fundamental rights uh, uh, from one side and from the other side, practices, customs, and values expressed by cultural minorities is strongly influenced by the concern that supporting the protection of fundamental rights hides racist or nationalist attitudes aimed at limiting minorities' liberties and cultural traditions. It is central, certainly true that this concern somehow conditions the debate. Uh, it is significant that recently some scholars have elaborated a phenomenon called femonationalism. Maybe you know uh, the, 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 the investigations, the studies by Sarah Ferris, huh? focusing on contemporary France, Italy, and the Netherlands, Sarah Ferris labels this exploitation and co-optation of feminist themes by anti-Islam and xenophobic campaigns as femonationalism. She shows that by characterizing Muslim males as dangerous to Western societies and as oppressor of, women's, of women, and by emphasizing the need to rescue Muslim and migrant women, these groups use gender equality to justify their racist rhetoric and policies. That's an interesting hypothesis, but even 
uh, Hawking's um, uh, thought, Hawking's ideas deserve consideration. Uh, is that it would be a big mistake considering feminism and multiculturalism such as necessary allied fellows because of the common grounds in sustaining oppressed groups, minority groups, or historical subordinated groups. In many cases, familiar segregation within migrant diasporic communities strongly contributes in isolating women and deprive them uh, of the instruments needed for the integration. I mean, tongue, common customs that generate mutual comprehension, uh, a common knowledge in terms of legal rights and duties provided by the hosting country. From this point of view, it is a primary concern to establish the conditions in which migrant women can go out. And among these conditions, some could request compromises with respect to cultural practices perceived as harmful, detrimental for self-determination and women's dignity. For instance, the ban on face covering, the ban on wearing hijab or general veil ban that some Western legislators declare as a normative system of liberation can strengthen domestic segregation. Let's think about the case of provisions such as in France or in Belgium, regarding schools and other educational institutions. Hawking directly discusses with the sociologist and legal scholar Will Kimlicka and his multicultural proposal that tries to go beyond the asphyxial debate between liberals and communitarians, suggesting a liberalism that gives value to every people, but at the same time recognizes the cultural right of minorities members. It is important to remember that Hawking does not completely reject Kimlicka thought, but she hypothesizes that it can be accepted whether that model of citizenship guarantees an effective representation of women within spaces and processes of negotiation between state and minorities and provides specific forms of participation, women's participation and uh, in uh, policy making. Already in Okin, it seems to appear the concept of agency, uh, a concept that um, I'm going to explore further. Uh, she talks about the participation to the decision making processes in the legal system as a whole and in the group that would be able to reconcile the multicultural coexistence with feminism. Uh, however, Kimlicka also he rejects Hawkins' juxtaposition between multiculturalism and feminism, accepts the criticism for what concerns the necessity that the entitlement of special rights for title, uh, cultural minorities depends from a deep investigation of the internal minority rights practices and values affecting individual liberty. There aren't any doubts on the importance of Hawking and her challenging question, but we also know well that various limits affect her proposal. Among them, the underestimation of the fact that even in the Western legal tradition, gender equality is far to be achieved and the progressive extirpation of gender discriminations in post-colonial and non-Western legal system, such as inside minorities and migrant communities, should match with a global engagement to the protection of human rights, especially in the field of women's rights. A parallel but different approach comparing with the Oaking one is represented by uh, Iris Marion Young, with her anti-orientalistic and anti-ethnocentric position. Iris Marion Young shares the concern for multiculturalism and its possible serial consequences in the case that it implies the possibility for minority groups to internally implement dynamics of exclusion and elimination of inner differences with the attempt to guarantee and finance homogeneity. 
of course, the efforts of minority groups to um, define and consolidate their own identity represents an important manifestation uh, of opposition against the cultural imperialism that characterizes even majority necessary. Comparing with Kimlika, uh, that supports uh, groups and their importance above all connecting them to the development of individual autonomy in the vision by Will Kimlika. Uh, Iris Marion Young believes that it exists an entangled relationship between individuals and groups, and this conditions and this condition leads to interpret cultural rights as an important tool for justice to be dedicated to oppress minorities. Anyway, not every group is seen in this way by Iris Marion Young, and this is a crucial point. Uh, because it's not easy to understand which are the groups that deserve recognition and representation. And the very question is then defining freedom and very fine the actual self-determination of women within their community. But which are the conditions needed to legitimately and realistically consider women's choices as free? When? Does a choice, uh, when can a choice be considered as free? Uh, without freedom, could be even um, uh, about a thought, a liberal politics on intercultural relations or the building of an intercultural law consistent with the international perspective of human rights and the transnational perspective of nationalism this is a big question. Uh, trying to employ a moral notion of liberty or um, the Kantian definition of autonomy uh, puts at risk the possibility itself to promote a dialogue between multiculturalism and women's fundamental rights. Uh, it is important, I believe, to identify a third way governing the relationships between institutions and minority groups different than the suppression or the strong limitation of expressions and fulfillment of membership, and different than the unconditioned support to multiculturalism. The third way leads towards the idea of agency, uh, that it is essential, I believe, in order to give the best interpretation to the relationship between multiculturalism, interculturalism, and women's rights. What is agency? Um, Spivak, um, I will send to you all uh, the quotations and the references in order to give you the possibility to, uh, to study and to have to go uh, uh, deeper in this in this um, reflections. Uh, Spivak, that is a Bangladeshi and American uh, philosopher, uh, describes agency such as the possibility for women to speak represent themselves and not being invisible subaltern anymore, neither in the post-colonial field where they, attempt, where they attempt to become a subject of a rebellion demanding for fundamental rights, but they are very often um, told, narrated by men. Uh, again, again. Uh, the question is uh, to what extent the agency could be developed within the boundaries of familiar communities and clans, characterized by a patriarchal structure and organization. A clear example regards the context in which a large part of women live in combined marriages, uh, often negotiating the boundaries of their existences with the institutions inside the group and their leaders. And many authors underline that in this case, uh, from the approval of this practice by women, I mean the combined marriage, uh, derives uh, the fulfillment of basically equivalent gender relationships within the family and the opportunity to practice freedom outside the house in the public sphere. Uh, so the challenge is to give the political institution and the law the role to encourage an active participation of women inside and outside the minority groups 
not only by protective provisions, but also by proactive interventions aimed at going beyond the oppressive dynamic. Uh, a turning point in the feminist investigation on uh, multiculturalism is represented by the so-called paradox of multicultural vulnerability. Uh, that is the paradox described by Shakar in On Citizenship and Multicultural Vulnerability. Um, what does it mean, the paradox of multicultural vulnerability? From one side, minority groups are marginalized by society and its majoritarian culture. And this fact causes uh, the emergence of many requests of accommodations and multicultural compromises by which the majority defends itself and the possibility to establish the identification of the legal system with a given and certain legal and ethical paradigm. From another side, minority women are often discriminated and subjected to unreasonably different treatment. So that the provisions of such accommodations, giving power and authority to minorities and their male leaders tend to determine stabilization of the oppressive leaders and of patriarchy, making women more vulnerable. This is the paradox. Legal theory and public policies should follow a different path, I believe, looking for a possible alternative in deliberative processes opened to vulnerable and marginalized people, minorities inside minorities, uh, promoting the participation and the deliberation of women in real making processes inside the groups. This is the core proposal by Susan Williams, who suggests the construction of a system of incentives and opportunities then who'd allow to challenge internally the hierarchical and oppressive architecture of the group. Balance and conciliation seem to be the keystones in the building of the relationship between individual rights and minority cultural rights. But as I mentioned, they are not enough because they need participatory instruments leading to substantial equality. The promotion of gender equality within pluralist systems need to direct the efforts, not towards the coercion that one system uh, practices on another, but towards methods directed to the enhancement and incentivization of a cultural transformation oriented to gender equality. For a long time, uh, even in the feminist perspective, a variety of important but insufficient mechanisms have been individuated in order to restrict um, the potentiality of the alternative legal orders generated by minority groups to cause or favor gender discriminations. These mechanisms generally consist of legal devices such as processes or institutions. Today, it is commonly perceived by constitutional scholars and political philosophers that it should be encourage inner cultural transformation, particular helping women to carry out a most important role in this transformation. This approach would strengthen the uh, identity and agency of the women involved, but it's important to underline the relevance of enhancing the role of minority women even within the majoritarian community. I mean, the legal system as a whole, uh, allowing them to effectively contribute in defining, in defining primary changes, not necessary equivalent with those agreed by the general and majoritarian legal system. The combination of external limits to alternative legal systems, accommodations, and uh, affirmative actions for internal subjectivities is not only possible, but is desirable. Uh, even in the framework picture by another very important uh, scholar that is Nancy Fraser, I'm sure you know, uh, she recommends some remedies aimed at conferring a louder voice uh, for women in the cultural transformation processes within minority, communi minority communities. Uh, Fraser distinguishes between affirmative remedies that affect 
uh, outcomes without modifying uh, political, legal, social institutions that through time generate an injustice. Um, that are what we call, generally we call affirmative actions hmm? and transformative remedies. They try to eradicate the true causes of injustice. Very hard to eradicate. Both of these categories, affirmative remedies, transformative remedies, need at the same time um, uh, and aim at the same time at achieving an equal democracy and can help to face the question of the legal status of women belonging to minorities and patriarchal cultures. The participatory side of gender equality can influence a different arrangement of legal pluralism and the relationship between multiculturalism and women's rights. Moreover, the turn towards substantial equality and participation was supported by United Nations many years ago uh, by the adoption of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of uh, Discrimination Against Women, you know, the CEDAW in 1979, the main international act on gender equality until the Bejil Declaration in 1995. And still today, the most important human rights are legislation for the protection of women's rights. CEDAW, you know, imposes to the states not only to guarantee equal rights for men and women, but also equal opportunities. And it was clear since the moment of its adoption that this would have implied in many cases uh, the introduction of affirmative proactive actions able to directly affect women as category. The convention established measures that produce an asymmetry through gender differentiated treatments in order to deconstruct the enduring condition of discrimination and guarantee an effective entitlement of political rights directed to the achievement of substantial equality. Some eminent scholars like Ruth Rubio Marin and with Kimnica himself studied and explained what they call the participatory turn in gender equality, the turning point from an egalitarian perspective of the achievement of uh, women's rights to a participatory one. They underlined the context in which multiculturalism entails um, um, uh, on uh, um, uh, Sorry, um, uh, the turning point from an egalitarian perspective of the achievement women's are at the participatory one by Ruth Rubio Marin and Will Kimica. And they underline uh, to what extent this, this transition uh, to uh, a participatory turn produced implication on the multicultural issue. Above all, in the context that they studied. Uh, in which multiculturalism entails the recognition of a certain degree of autonomy for minorities, uh, allowing uh, uh, self-regulation to minorities uh, and the possibility to use their own legal systems and cultural rules, notwithstanding the general rules in some field. This autonomy sometimes uh, is the same as a true legal or constitutional recognition of the minority legal order. Um, a sort of customary law in some cases, or uh, the rule of personal laws. Eh? Let's think about India, for example, in other cases. Uh, anyway, it determines a potential disruptive conflict between the participatory turn of gender equality and these pluralistic tendencies uh, to uh, recognize uh, autonomous legal systems, legal orders within the general legal order. And this is typical of various uh, countries, as we see uh, even in Europe. Let's think, for example, about uh, United Kingdom or Greece. Indeed, in many contexts in which minorities have been integrated by the legitimation of traditional legal systems based on religion or customs, women didn't have an equal role in decision-making process. This fact from Ansad shows that multicultural rights and minority self-government can contrast the objective of the equal democracy. From another side, that the transplants 
of participatory instruments in the minority's decision making has got the capacity to make more flexible the implementation of cultural rights. This kind of internal multiculturalism distinctly emerged in the analysis of the case of Islamic minorities in the Western legal system. Uh, since many years, the phenomenon of uh, Islamic feminism is studied as a concrete example of the forms of agency women that act together, uh, claiming their rights and expressing their religious belief. This would be a perfect manifestation of a plural and variable identities that embody in minority uh, women. Uh, these women maybe do not share the Western path towards the achievement of their own subjectivity, uh, characterized by the philosophical and legal Western tradition, but they search native solutions, reworking their cultural identity in order to build a different and decolonized uh, gender awareness. Uh, there aren't any reasons to exclude the possibility that this awareness progressively will lead also the patriarchal minority communities towards um, uh, the presence of women in decision-making processes. The tricky point concerns the possibility to build the agency of women belonging to minority groups, and which relationship exists between this agency and the paradigms of freedom and individual autonomy that we usually take into consideration from the constitutional perspective of fundamental rights. It implicates to understand to what extent the liberal approach grounded on the personal choice would be consistent with factual multicultural societies and factual pluralist legal system. There is um, another aspect that we should take into consideration, uh, the limitation of freedoms derived from cultural rules and practices for regard not only women directly involved in those rules, but the cultural practices, even when freely adopted by women involved, could produce a, a wound, a vulnus, with respect to the constitutional values because it would legitimate subordination and oppression against other uh, women. Uh, it's something like this approach uh, is something like uh, the approach that some um, um, North American uh, legal scholars and feminists such as uh, Catherine McKinnon, for example, uh, used in uh, uh, her elaboration on pornography uh, uh, and the relation between pornography and the freedom of expression. Um, whether liberty is a collective question, not only an individual concern, it would not be useful the distinction between practices that cause physical material damages or uh, reparable violations and fundamental rights, inalienable rights, and other ones that do not have these characters because the collective damage could emerge in any case. Um, both the consideration of individual freedom and that of the collective impact should include not only the oppressive minority sense, but also the majorities. In these, as I mentioned, Western societies know well pressures, conditioning that often lead women to act on themselves, on their bodies, uh, to renounce their fundamental rights in order to execute expectations and desires draft by men. Every time we describe a woman as free, we should wonder whether she had alternatives or try to imagine what could it happen, whether that woman in that situation didn't act in that way. Uh, for that matter, as um, I said, all women as adaptive preferences. This notion of adaptive preference was used by Soliar in her condition for autonomy and more responsibility and her feminist perspective on autonomy. Women's preferences, uh, writes Soliar, repeatedly adapt with certain rules establishing what femininity should be, rules shaped around the separation of gender roles and stereotypes. We know many types and many cases of adapted uh, preferences. I have no time uh, to, uh, to underline and to speak about, of course, all uh, of them. Um, uh, however, it would be dangerous to presume freedom in the choices made by women 
in any case, and then also by women living inside patriarchal groups. Uh, this presumption would block them within the boundaries of the oppressive structures where they spend their lives. Uh, because of this reason, some scholars put in evidence the importance of uh, precisely delineate the notion of agency. Okay, we can use the notion of agency, it's very important, it's the third way that uh, I thought about, but it is important to delineate this notion. It shall be used to recognize and condition cultural rights of the groups, taking into consideration women's participation and empowerment without rejecting vulnerability, actually starting from vulnerability in order to obtain rooms and forms of participation. In this scenario, I believe it is very useful the idea by Anne Phillips of bargaining patriarchy. Uh, that is the strategy of negotiation that I've already mentioned and often characterizes women's action within patriarchal context. Uh, this strategy reverberates in a relational autonomy that represents the true essence of agency. Because overcoming the Rossian vision of freedom and rights converts women, women from submissive subjects, I evoke Sheila Benabib, uh, that invokes uh, Michel Foucault, to subjects that decide their position in the public sphere. Uh, this turn favors minority women, but influences also the way in which women make their choices inside the community and uh, by spillover effect uh, affects the approach of democracies and Western democracies towards constitutional liberties and women's fundamental rights. Uh, the comparative law shows some interesting experiences, as said, among them, that of management of interlegality and in particular the relationship between European legal systems and Islamic minorities through the so-called Sharia Council, uh, the management of uh, multiculturalism and the interlegality in Europe present two significant cases in Greece and United Kingdom, as I said. Many studies have, have been carried out uh, in the last years about the last case, uh, focusing in particular on the courts in England that employ Islamic law in the field of family relations. Just these investigations illustrate that the relationship between multiculturalism and women's rights should be analyzed in the framework of the Istanbul Convention. From the point of view of the gender analysis, also these courts, among their many uh, functions, have the power to certificate the religious divorce and the law, the second weddings to Muslim women. It is important to underline that the paradigm of familiar mediation and reconciliation poses some problems in this field because it could be equivalent to a limitation of the protection of fundamental rights, a regression respect to their violation and the results could be an invisibilization of the minority women. On this point, the Istanbul Convention poses a crucial norm, you know, the Article 48, the first point, that establishes the adoption of the necessary legislative or other kinds of measures in order to prohibit mandatory alternative dispute resolution processes, including mediation and conciliation, in relation to all forms of violence covered by the Convention. And the motivation for this ban, you know, is the recognition that violence against women is a manifestation of historically unequal power relations between women and men, which have led to domination over and discrimination against women by men and to the prevention of the full advance of women. And the structural nature of violence against women as gender-based violence forced into a subordinate uh, position uh, compared uh, with men. It is clear that the rationale of this provision in Article 48 in particular is that mediation can be used by who acts violence to control the pardon victim of the violence itself. With regard to minority group and particularly Islamic minorities, 
Many could be the concerns about making recourse to alternative dispute resolution, considering also that the management of this kind of processes could be governed by legal institutions that are above all moral authorities, more than legal ones, interested above all in preserving their religious dominance. These concerns would expand beyond the field of domestic violence and beyond the range of criminal uh, relevance that in any case is always outside the functions of these bodies of Sharia councils, even though someone reports the appropriation of jurisdiction even in the criminal matter. As I said, family relationships stay at the center of the tension between multiculturalism and women's rights. We can remind that until the middle of the 70s in the last centuries, marriage was considered the source of mutual physical and moral assistance obligations, including obligations aimed at sexual fulfillment of the spouse. Uh, sexual relations were intended as subjective rights uh, and the crime of rape was applied only in case of compulsion to sexual intercourse and are related to the procreative purpose, purposes or in case of injury or blow. It is evident that this approach determined the recognition of something like an exempt grounded in a specific interpretation of a relationship between genders and of the marriage that is called in the common law tradition, be careful because we can find it in the common law in the core of the common law uh, tradition where uh, was born the marital rape Exemption. We have to remind this point and was supported by uh, legal scholars such as Hale and Blackstone in the common law tradition that believed that marital rape exemption was motivated by the double execution of the coverture and the implied consent doctrines, doctrines that uh, belong to the common law tradition. The marital rape exemption is still used by some North American states in order to establish differentiated treatments between marital and non-marital rapes. And it is used until there, uh, 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 arise, there is and derives a sentence of divorce. Very interesting, uh, very interesting is also the Indian case that I previously mentioned, where law in the books and law in action deeply occur in a post-colonial context where the formal ban of some practices does not correspond to a real development of civil and social relation, but where the common law uh, tradition and the customary law and now the personal laws um, mix in order to um, endure. Uh, uh, gender uh, discriminations, uh, for example, just using this form of, of exemption uh, that I said. Um, today, this exemption is grounded on the idea that the marital rape would represent a problem that cannot be subjected to the intervention of criminal law uh, because uh, it's quantitatively uh, limited and less serious than the phenomenon of sexual assault made by unknown attackers. This is the, 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 uh, the argument that is used, but it is evident that these arguments are completely inconsistent with the universal condemnation of every kind of slavery and uh, with the instable convention itself that provides, you know, Article 12.5 that parties shall ensure that culture, custom, religion, tradition, or so-called honor, honor shall not be considered as justification for any acts of violence covered by the convention. And the convention of Insamul itself dedicated article 42 to unacceptable justifications for crimes, including crimes committed in the name of the so-called uh, honor, uh, establishing that parties shall ensure that in criminal proceedings, in a setting following the commission of any of the acts of violence covered by uh, the uh, convention, culture, custom, religion, tradition, and honor shall not be regarded as justification for such, for such acts. Uh, for this investigation, it is important to underline that the Istanbul Convention makes a strong choice to struggle against domestic and gender violence starting just from its cultural roots. This choice 
has an implication um, uh, just in the article, uh, this article 12, 12.5, because uh, it would not make sense an effort to eradicate the sexist and discriminatory attitude that nourishes the violence against women. And at the same time, uh, the tendency to excuse the single acts of violence carried out on the basis of this attitude. And the convention seems, I believe, to expressly set forth the unacceptability of the so-called cultural defenses that, of course, you know, and that have been used in many, many uh, jurisdictions in order to, uh, to uh, treat, to face um, uh, cultural-oriented uh, uh, behaviors um, against women. Uh, the Istanbul Convention faces not only the cultural roots of gender violence, but also the transcultural dissemination of this problem. In particular, the Convention is aware of the way in which migratory flows in the last decades transformed European states, societies, and legal systems. On one side, the text of the convention takes into consideration some forms of violence against women that these states will have to face because of the multicultural nature of their societies. From the other side, it dedicated a specific attention to the terms of implementation of its norms in the case that the authors and or the victims of the violence aren't citizens of the European states where they live. With regard to the first aspect, the attention of the uh, transcultural dissemination of gender violence is expressed by the norms that individuate among the types of offense, the practices that strictly concern the relationship between multiculturalism and feminism, and more generally, the relationship between cultural differences and fundamental rights. The convention imposes to the states the adoption of the necessary measures to criminalize all the behaviors such as forced marriages, genital female mutilations, forced abortion and sterilization, illustrated in articles 37, 38, and 39. In particular, article 37 imposes to the member states to ensure that intentional conduct of forcing an adult or a child to enter into a marriage is criminalized. And um, Article 38 provides the necessary measures in order to criminalize uh, genital female mutilation. And Article uh, 39 focuses on um, uh, abortion uh, and sterilization. Um, the choice of the criminal tool in order to contrast these practices uh, this point could reopen some controversial questions uh, regarding the best institutional policies to uh, guarantee the protection of fundamental rights in multicultural society. This aspect needs a deep discussion, I believe, and investigation on limits and obstacles able to affect the legal, political, and social impact of the convention. Um, with regard to the second aspect, I mean the terms of implementation, uh, the convention expresses big concerns for what regards the effectiveness of the protest. But criminal remedies are followed by civil consequences only in the case of forced marriages. I refer to Article 32, that provides that the parties shall ensure that marriages concluded under force may be voidable, annulled, or dissolved without undue financial or administrative burden placed on the victim. The convention states the fundamental right to physical and psychological integrity of every woman, regardless of the place where she comes from, her citizenship, or her culture without discrimination on any ground. I refer to Article 4.3. This provision represents an important innovation, uh, I believe, with respect to the traditional anti-discrimination rules provided by the international law. Uh, moreover, facing the possible ambiguities concerning the political and legal relationships that exist between 
the origin countries of migrants and the country where they live. The convention establishes the criteria regulating jurisdiction in the field of violence against women. In particular, it imposes uh, to the member states the duty to adopt legislative and other measures necessary to ensure that their jurisdiction is not subordinated to the condition that the acts are criminalized in the territory where they were committed. That is Article 44.3. And to ensure that their jurisdiction is not subordinated to the condition that the prosecution can only be initiated following the reporting by the victim of the offense of the laying of information by the state of the place where the offense was committed according to Article 44.4. The explanatory uh, report of the convention, as I'm, <laughs> I'm going to finish in some minutes, the explanatory report of the convention illustrates that these provisions link to the numerous cases in which the victim is uh, persuaded to temporarily go back to her origin country in order to force her when there to be subjected to one among the violent behaviors that the convention recognizes as crime. We shall underline that this norm refers exclusively to the crimes of forced marriage, marriage, abortion and civilization, um, genital uh, mutilations and rape but not every form of violence. It seems to postulate is there at this point a strict connection between a minority status and specific types of crimes and describe a specific protection for, mi for migrant women victims of some crimes considered as a consequence of the belonging of a not Western or European culture. Let's remind also that these situations are included within those that any state uh, or the European Union may at the time of signature when deposing its instrument of ratification by a declaration, declare that it reserves the right not to apply or to apply only in specific cases or conditions according to Article 78.2. And I believe that the convention shows the awareness of the complex uh, relations between multiculturalism and women's rights. But at the end, I want to share with you um, a slide, if I will succeed in this. Maybe, I, I hope that you can see this. Um, slides because I believe that now we, uh, we, we can refer to some numbers and to the very important perspective that uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda by United Nations uh, focuses, focuses uh, directly and specifically on gender equality in the uh, goal number five, and focuses also on this relation that today I tried to discuss with you, that is the relationship between um, multiculturalism and women's rights. And uh, the last question that I pose in this slide is that culture, we have here some numbers about violence, uh, specific forms of violence against women strictly connected with the relationship between multiculturalism and women's rights and, and violence against women. And maybe the problem is that, is this culture or this is a patriarchy because patriarchy is not culture. And in this sense, I propose to you uh, the perspective of women's agency because I believe that the perspective of women's agency can uh, go beyond the traditional perspective of um, a relationship between cultural practices, cultural rights, minority cultures, and gender discriminations, but allows to focus on women, on women. I thank you for your, uh, your kind attention. And now I'm going to 
wait for your your questions. I'm trying to exit from the sharing screen. If I will able to do this. Thank you very much, Professor, for your detailed, enlightening, and significant presentation on the perspective of the Istanbul Convention on the issue of women and multiculturalism. Now we can move on to the Q&A part. Dear participants, if you write your questions in the chat section, I will read them so that the questions will be recorded and our speaker will have heard and be able to give the answers. We are waiting for your questions. Uh, I'm trying to exit from the, the sharing screen, but... Uh... I don't know, maybe now. Okay. Okay. Now I see you. <laughs> Thank you again, Professor. Thank you. We are waiting for the questions of the participants now. I'm sorry if I if my presentation was a bit um, longer than <laughs> the time that I had. Professor Suzer, I want to thank with all my heart, Professor Suzer, for this kind invitation. I'm very happy to be with you. I hope we'll have many occasions to, to organize together events. I see that you have many, many, many students in this summer school, then compliments. I will, uh, I will send to uh, the organizers all the references, all the quotations that I made in my presentation in order that all the students will able to, to receive these references and maybe uh, they will able to read some other contributions on the topic. Hello, Elatra. Uh, firstly, uh, I am very happy uh, to you see again. I have a message uh, for you. Uh, Begum, can you uh, read my message? My dear colleague, Eletra Stradella, thank you very much for your contribution to our Law and the Bosphorus Summer School uh, with your work titled uh, Women and Multiculturalism in the Framework of the Istanbul Convention. You have very explicit and informative on the topic. You have touched upon very neglected topic within the subject. Particularly, it is, very, uh, it is a very vital topic for Turkey, since in Turkey there are a wide range of minorities group and as consequence many different cultures. Thank, thanks to you, our participants have learned important aspects of the subject. I hope we will work harder and we will eradicate the violence against women and domestic violence and provide gender equality at all level. I hope that our work will continue for the future. We will continue to increase cooperation <clears throat> and joint studies in order to benefit from our experiences mutually. I would like to thank you for your contributions again. I hope we will see you in another event soon face to face. All the best, Adam Suzer. Thank you, Professor Suzer. Thank you very much for your very, very kind words. I want uh, to suggest to the students, because I wanted to show in my presentation, but it was too, um, too time standing. I want to suggest a video that you can find uh, on YouTube that I believe is um, for young students. It could be very useful and interesting. That is a video. The title of the video is It's Your Fault. Maybe uh, you know. It's Your Fault is a video made by the group All India Black Hood, uh, where the um, Bollywood actress uh, Kalki Koichin and the VJ Yui Pan, they put in evidence in a very sharp manner the mechanisms uh, that intervene in blaming women uh, victims of rape. I suggest you to, to watch this video, It's Your Fault is the title, and the title is very significant. Uh, typically, when there is a rape, it's woman's fault. Uh, I wanted to, to share 
the video with you, but we have no enough time, but I suggest all the students to watch, uh, to watch this video. Ah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Begum. Begum has put in the chat the link, the YouTube link of the video. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. And we have a question uh, from Bilge Erbash. Mm -hmm. How can we find a sweet spot for addressing cultural offenses against women without making a dis distinction between cultures like good or bad cultures? <laughs> this is a crucial point, I believe, and we, we uh, do not have to make this distinction, even if in some Western legal system, this distinction uh, has been done, above all, by uh, even by the instrument of cultural defenses, because when you uh, define a culture mm, with all the behaviors that can be uh, linked to that culture, the risk is to describe a culture that is not. The risk is to stereotype the culture, uh, to make a sort of crystallization of the culture. For example, many years ago in many courts, uh, for example, we got to Italians. Huh? Uh, it's very, very famous a case in North America, where an American court um, used the cultural defense in favor of an Italian man, a Sicilian man, uh, that was violent against, uh, um, the, uh, against the wife and was violent against his uh, uh, child. And the American court wrote that that man was in that way because he was Sicilian, he was Italian and he was Sicilian. And you know, in Sicily, violence is commonly used as an instrument of education. And this is terrible because the problem is that when you try to externally define and describe a culture, the risk is that uh, you describe something that it doesn't exist. Uh, you risk to use stereotypes to describe the culture with all the consequences. Uh, then I believe that uh, the first instrument is that courts and jurisdictions have to use in a very, very um, careful way the notion of culture and all these form of cultural defenses or the notion of cultural offenses, because very often judges are not, uh, have not the competencies, have not the knowledge to describe what culture is. And it's very dangerous to um, pretend to say what. Uh, if a, a conduct, if a behavior is culturally oriented or determined or not. Then I, uh, my, pro my proposal move from uh, the focus on women. In, in many passages in my relation, my presentation, I said, be careful because even in Western legal system, we have many gender discriminations. Gender violence, unfortunately, is, as you know, a phenomenon that regards all the countries in the world, that regards also Western countries. Uh, uh, um, gender discrimination, gender subordination uh, is far to be achieved even in uh, Western country, even in Western culture. I said marital rape exemption was born in the common law tradition. It was Blackstone that wrote about uh, the differences between marital rape and sexual assault intercourses in, uh, uh, out from the, the, the marriage. Then I, I agree with you. Uh, the, the, the path is not towards the distinction between cultures, but the path is towards 
I believe, uh, the concept of agency. Uh, putting women at the center of um, politics, of deliberation processes, of policy making. Uh, it's because of this fact that in my presentation, I told about the so-called participatory term, because gender equality, I believe, need not only anti-discrimination policies, but need all or protective norms, but need also proactive norms, need also um, intervention that affect democracy itself, the possibility, the presence of women in the deliberative process. And this regard, of course, both the minority groups, hmm, uh, but even the legal systems, the rules, the legal orders, um, the general legal orders. The participatory term should affect minority groups and majority groups. In this way, using this kind of approach, um, this dangerous distinction, moral distinction between bad cultures and good cultures, I believe, um, could be uh, neglected. Uh, I hope that I've been clear in my, in my answer. Of course, it's a big theme and uh, strictly connected with this topic. And I hope that also the references uh, that I will suggest to you um, will be useful in order to, uh, to go deeper uh, on this point that is crucial. Thank you very much again, Professor Stradella. As far as I can see, there is no other question. So now we have a 15 minute break. Maybe there is another question maybe uh, on gender quotas in the chat. Yeah, now. Yeah. now uh, okay. I'm going to- What role, if any, should quotes play in your notion of participatory deliberative democracy? A very good question. Uh, of course, um, uh, quotas play an important role in this notion of participatory deliberative democracy. Uh, gender quotas, you know, uh, was born uh, with the CEDO. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned the CEDO in 1979 in my presentation. Uh, the idea of um, use instruments that eradicate subordination, differentiation, uh, uh, even by uh, quotas is an idea that started in the 70s. And I believe that is fundamental for the participatory term. I know there are many criticisms on gender quotas, uh, but um, the idea of equal democracy is an idea that regard not only women's rights. Gender quota, wrote Rubio Marin, uh, wrote uh, in a very uh, beautiful manner all this concept. Gender quotas are not important only for, uh, in order to achieve um, gender equality and in order to guarantee women's rights. Gender quotas are uh, uh, better. Um, gender equality in political rights, the presence of women in um, participatory processes, in political decision-making at all levels. This point is necessary for the quality of democracy. It's not only um, a problem for women, it's a problem for democracy. Liberal democracies, that do not have parity, that do, that do not have uh, an effective presence of women at all level of political, social, economic engagement and development is not a democracy. Uh, then um, I suggest you, you, you to read and Autorbio Marin, but because focuses um, very clearly, uh, clear manner at this point, gender quotas 
are an important instrument in order to improve the quality of democracies, of our democracies, not only for women's rights, then I believe that is a very important point. And also inter in the international law, that things many years put this instrument as a fundamental instrument, European law at all levels. But in my country, Italy, we are very, very far to achieve an equal democracy, a democracy where we have substantial equality between men and women. Ben. Thank you again, Professor Stradella, for your enlightening presentation and also your clear uh, answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope we'll be together in many other occasions and uh, see you. Yeah, that's what I hope to see you. And after the break, we will listen to today's other presentation. Thank you all. <laughs>